Hey, welcome back, everybody, this week to Doing It With Styles. And um, you know I love music. Uh, and if you'll notice that most of us here are wearing some um, strange garb. Uh, they're called kurtas. And I'm wearing this in honor of my guests, Gene Gunnell, George Bones, Mark Weitz, Mark Weitz, or yeah. Wheats. Yeah, it goes, so it's, it's, Gene, it's Gene Gunnels, That's George right. Bunnell, and Mark Stephen Weitz. Gotcha. Okay. Original anyway. members. But ben there Bell. were there were things in print that had Mark's last name as W-E-A-T-S. And really? so we called him Wheats for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst other, other things. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. These are members of the group, the Strawberry Alarm Clock. Yay. And I, I, I got to tell you guys, I, I don't know if you were aware of my side of this. Um, I was back from Vietnam maybe three or four days when I walked into my sister's boutique in Westwood, California. And good God, what the hell is going on here? And that's what yeah. We're doing your album cover in my sister's boutique. Yes, uh, and that's Barouche. That was a that was a hell of a hell of a, a, a culture shock at that time. And, <laughs> it was for us too. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> but um, and then um, and I know this is this is jumping ahead quite a bit. But then in uh, 2017, wasn't it when you redid the album cover? Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Was yeah, it was the fiftieth anniversary. Fiftieth yeah. anniversary, yeah, exactly. I thought that was the coolest thing since peanut butter, man. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, that was that was Mark's little baby. And, yeah. Oh yeah. All right. But I, guess I, what? So I so here's okay, like all the way back to sixty seven, yes, and sir. her and your sister Kathy Scarms, her shop was called Designs Because of Sat Perouge. That's well, cool. we all, a friend of mine said, hey, you guys ought to get, you know, the clothes like you had back in the, in 67. He goes, you're, you're not dressing right on, on stage. And he goes, he said, it's like selling Pepsi in a, in a seven up can. And I, and I said, hey, that's funny. And, and I think you're right. And so I, I brought, I said that to the band and they said, well, what do we do? How do, and I said, well, I'm going to try to search and see if I can find, you know, Kathy Scarms. And, and so what I did, I searched for Kathy. I couldn't find anything. And then um, I found, uh, I, I, oh, Sat Perush. I, I Googled Sat Perush, and all it came up with was the Indian god, you know, named Sat Perush. And then I thought, well, you know, those things, the, the labels inside said designs because of Sat Perouge. And actually where I got that was on the back of our album cover. And because we gave uh, Kathy the credit on the back of the album and it said design. And I went, oh, so I, I Googled designs because of Sat Perouge, And it came up with Kathy Scarbs and her saying, I, you know, I was the seamstress for the band. I, you know. I designed the clothes for the strawberry alarm clock and I was like, Oh my God. So I contacted her It had a contact thing. And so we hooked up and I said, can you make us close? She goes, well, I haven't been doing that for a while. She goes, but I would sure love to, you know? And so we did it. And then fast forward to 2017. Wait, I, have, I have to stop you there for a second, George, because about a day or two after that, Kathy called me. And she, oh, guess who I got a call from? Blah, blah, blah. And, and she was really jazzed that you guys had had gone to that uh, effort to track her down, and because that that was something her whole life that she was pretty proud of, you know. Yeah. And uh, the whole shop and everything that was going on at that time, 1967. I mean, what the fuck? Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. She. She. Oh was, no, that that yeah that that it was great. Uh, we had a real fun conversation then, but. Yeah, so then Mark came up with the idea of, of 
reproducing the album cover, the first Incense and Peppermint's album cover, which we had, like you said, did in her, in her shop. In 19, we were like in 67 and and that we were like window dressing. I mean, there were people walking by going, what? well, you were there. And um, anyway, so she she decided she would she could make the pillows and uh, and use the materials that were draped around and make it all look just like the uh, album cover. And Mark rented a, a, a what do you call those chairs? The caftan or something. Oh, yeah. Around. Yeah, uh, the rattan, those rattan with the rattan, rattan yeah. 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 and then he and then he he got the the one of the guys on the album on the original album cover is holding a fan. Well, Mark blew up the picture of that fan. I and recreated then, which, it, and he recreated it. it and like then, and also uh, Kathy made the lamp shade that we put in the lamp, and. Uh, yeah, uh, somehow, I don't know how we did it, but we pulled it all together and it made it look pretty darn close to the 67 album. Yeah, especially when we put the, our friend Robert Jacobs did a uh, a mock-up of it with the original album cover framing it, you know, and, and the, had the, uh, the new picture. The artwork. Yeah, yeah. He, he superimposed the artwork from the 67 album cover right on top of it. And it was a Getting image. Um, you look at it and you just go, oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All the members that were still in the band took the uh, original positions in the picture as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. And since uh, since we uh, had lost uh, uh, Ed King and Lee Freeman and Gary Levitro was no longer in the band, uh, we had a, a little personnel uh, jockeying around so but we got it to come out pretty balanced so Steve Bartek was on the right and uh, George stood in his original position and on the left uh, instead of Ed King it was uh, uh, Howie Anderson our, our 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 new guitar player that took Ed King's place and, and uh, Gene, Gene, was, Lee Freeman. Gene was there and I was sitting in the original chair and Randy was laying down on the same type of pillows he was in the original photo and boom, there we were. We had a sitar in the, uh, a, a real sitar in the photo, just like we did in the original and everything. How much you fun, know, guys? That was great. You know what else is really cool about it is there's um, the authenticity of it is, is amazing because the first album, which is what that is, um, had Gene was on it because Gene played drums on Incense and Peppermints, which was the title of the album, the title track. And, and uh, and, Birdman of Alcatraz. And Bird, yeah, but that didn't make it to the album of all things. It wasn't on the album. Was it on the flip side of Incense? I think it was. Yeah, it was on the yeah. single. Yeah. Uh, on, and, on the and, single. Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. The, the single. Yeah. So, and then yeah, Steve, luckily it was on the flip side. And then Steve Bartek who's in the band now, he played flute on the first album on a couple of songs and wrote a, about four of them with me. And, and I, and of course, Mark and I and Randy seal were all on the first album. So there's five of us that are currently in the band that played on that first album. So it's actually pretty darn genuine, even though there's two dead guys, but they're still dead that we couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> we tried. We, how many, to give them a call. How, how many bands have that many of their original members 50 years later? You got me. Uh, you know, it's the, it's not the Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it isn't. Oh, and, especially now. They lost Charlie and, you know. And Brian back then, you know. so Maybe a long time ago they lost their guy. Yeah. But it, name, bass player, uh, Ralph Nader. No, they they their bass player quit. Yes. Yeah. Um, He's not doing anymore. So incense and peppermint was was and, and the thing that I find kind of funny or, or or a little bit weird was that you have been classed as acid rock at times, and yeah. I I never quite got that. I mean, yeah, it's it's you know the psychedelic rock and and that kind of thing, but. I never really, is that something that you guys thought about or? or yeah, you know what, they, it, it, back in those days, I don't even know if that was the term, but it, because they used to call us like in, in if, if you saw like a magazine or something, it said they do 
you know, uh, jazz and raga and classical combined, you know. And then somebody, I guess, later came up with psychedelic music. Yeah. But we never called it that. But And then when, when we used to get really offended when people called it bubblegum. Because we didn't, and they only called it bubble gum because peppermints was in the name of the song, I think. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, I have no idea how we got figured into being bubble gum. Well, it's obvious the people that called us bubble gum never saw us live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were the farthest thing from bubble gum. We were yeah. not the 1912 fruit company. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, know. Um, you know. You know what else, Mark, is, and, and, and John, is that we played all our own instruments, except for Steve played flute on the album, <laughs> but we played all our own instruments and a lot of these other groups didn't. I mean, the Turtles didn't, you know, there was like a lot of, and the association and a bunch of other, well, the association, they did play some stuff, but they also used, you know. The Wrecking Crew. Yeah, yeah. the Wrecking Crew. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Beach Boys, I mean, they used the Wrecking Crew, even though they could all play. They, their first four albums, I think they had they were they played, and then after that, you know, Brian Wilson stayed home and just hired those guys. But well, you know, we were our own. We were we played and sang. <laughs> I, I haven't run into anyone uh, from the '60s that that doesn't know Incense and Peppermints. I mean, yeah. that's one of the iconic songs of of the '60s, uh, and and. How did that come about? Where did where did all of that come from? Oh boy, it's Mark. It came from Mark sexually, you know. And it Mark started. Well, well, hey George, why don't you let me tell you a quick story, real quick? Yeah, actually, I, it's uh, not that quick. <laughs> yeah, it's quick. It is. I I have a nutshell version. <laughs> yeah. I sat down, hey, um, I sat down at the piano one day and I came up with this little ditty that da 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 and I I threw some chords on it and I called it up on the phone. I said, Ed, can you come over? I've got a song here, but I don't have a bridge to it. That's a, like the center section of the song. So Ed came over in about 45 minutes to an hour. We knocked it out. And then we went to the band and say, hey, we got instrumental, guys. And uh, we went into the studio. We recorded it. It was over four minutes. We had no lyrics to it. And it was in the can, finished. And our manager, uh, I mean, our producer... Uh, sent it. Uh, he said, this song, this uh, track needs lyrics to it. Uh, George, I'm leaving some parts out, but I'm Well, just you're leaving out a really, my favorite part of that whole Frank Slay thing is that yeah. he said his, one of his writers, because he was a publisher, so he had writers. And so he was he, our producer. Frank Slay was yeah, our producer. He was our producer, but he also owned a publishing company and had songwriters. But, and he said, one of my writers had, has a title called Incense and Peppermints with, with no body of lyrics. And I think that this music fits it. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> he sent, uh, we had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape, a little tiny one, sent it to them. They lived in Colorado Springs, Colorado. They send it back playing a uh, six-string uh, uh, guitar uh, with the uh, melody line and the lyrics. And uh, our producer called us to his office in Hollywood on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. We sat down, we listened to it on the big speakers and we looked at each other and we go, wow, you know. So we went into the studio and uh, we all tried to sing the um, the lead uh, uh, melody on the uh, on the, the big Neumann microphone. And none of us sounded right for the for the for the song. Our, our voice just didn't fit it. And we had a, a guest sitting on the floor right watching us uh, in that session that day. His name was Greg Munford. Uh, he had his own band, and uh, our manager, uh, uh, he was uh, a guest of our, our manager, uh, Bill Holmes. And uh, we said, hey, Greg, he's 16 years old, right? The rest of the band was 18. I was like 21. And uh, Greg, why don't you try a crack at it? So uh, they ran the track, and Greg got up in front of the mic, and uh, we were all looked at each other at amazement. His voice sounded the, the best in the in the room and he wasn't even in the band so we asked him to join the band he goes no i got my own band uh thanks anyway so we went ahead uh they finished the song they mastered it and who knew that it was going to go to a number one spot six months later but um 
uh, it turns out after the song climbed up the charts, there was nothing we can do about it because here we're, we're, we're in the top 10 and moving up towards the number one position. And we have uh, uh, Greg Munford that wasn't even in the band that sang, the, you know, so our, our drummer, after Gene left the band, um, uh, uh, Randy Seal came in and he had to kind of mimic um, uh, Greg's voice. So when we started playing on TV shows and everything, Greg, uh, I mean, uh, Randy had to become Greg and uh, nobody really knew that it wasn't Randy singing. Yeah, yeah but not then. It, not it, then, it, yeah. Your live performances back there, it, it, you really can't tell the difference. I mean, he did a great job. Yeah, he but did. Don't forget, we're uh, we, uh, Greg was 16, Randy was 18. So the intonations and, you know, Randy tried his best to try to, to mimic his voice, although everybody has a different voice print, but no, you know what, Mark? Best, and somehow we we got by, and a lot of times it didn't even come up in the conversation, so we just went with it. Hey, and Mark, when, yeah. there's a thing about you know it's been written that Greg was 16. He, he was born the same year as me and Randy. You know he was older. He was 17 at the time, oh, okay. and then okay. so was Randy. They were both 17. Wow. I turned 18 in June. And okay. So, and and Gene was also didn't turn uh, eighteen until July. Yeah. And when, so, when so, I was, Ed and Lee were seventeen all the way till the end of the year. Right before we changed the name from these six pens to the Strawberry Alarm Clock, which is another story. When I joined the these six pens, I think there was a couple of guys in the band that were seventeen. Yeah. I was the old guy coming in at twenty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gene, you've got to tell. Okay, now that we've told all this, you have to. Gene has to tell his part of the because Gene played the iconic drum break on Incense and Peppermint. The yeah, hi hat. Did that bum bit of that bop, bop, and the great intro to it and the beat of the song. Everything the you know yeah. the song. A lot of the reason that it was a hit was because it was this groove that he had. But anyway, Gene's got to tell the story of why he. Because no, he didn't get kicked out of the band. He left the band before yeah. the song came out. Yeah, I had a couple of reasons for uh, for quitting the band. And one of them was... You were incarcerated? Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. My girl, that didn't happen until now. I can't get a real job. <laughs> and so I, I believed her. <laughs> and, I, and I quit. Uh, uh, but one of the other reasons I, uh, I quit the band was exactly what Mark said, was that we had recorded a lot of songs before that, um, a lot of uh, covers, and with I- the six, With the sixpence. With the sixpence, correct. And um, I felt that uh, we had recorded and I was starting to get a little bit jaded, but I also felt that we did not have a lead singer in the band that had a character voice. I mean, Mark's Mark's voice was the most character voice of anybody in the band, but he wasn't really the lead singer at that point. It was uh, Lee Freeman, and and I felt well, I'll just go with what my girlfriend said and quit <laughs> and get a real job. Get a real job. So I got one at McDonald's, <laughs> a real job. And, yeah. Um, and so, so, how long did you stay with that girl? Uh, very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, until, wait, wait, until November of 67 when Incense and Peppermint hit number one and you said, you're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Ed actually had, had said to me, he said, he said, Gene, this was before Randy had joined the band after I left. And he said, Gene, I think something's going to happen with this song. Do you want to stay in the band or would you please not leave the band? And I said, No. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's my reasons for for quitting the band is we kind of kind of getting jaded because we had already recorded so many songs before and nothing was really happening with any of those songs, and we did not have a character voice like Mick Jagger, you know, uh, things like that. So if I had known that, I would have called you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what's funny? I wouldn't have been in the band if Gene didn't quit. If he didn't quit, 
<laughs> there's a lot of serendipity things that happened yeah. in this band yeah. because we were we were primarily two bands that got together george and randy and uh we're we're in a different band and and gene myself ed king lee freeman uh were in the these six pence and when we joined it was actually two writing schools that got together and uh sometimes a little bit competitive you know because uh, they uh george and and steve uh wrote like four songs i believe on the first album and uh when when incense of peppermints uh went to number one uni records our record uh, company said hey we need an album and uh george and steve had uh they had a, a a bunch of songs that we all listened to and liked and so we went in the studio real quick and we had i think a week or two to make that whole album and uh we recorded uh strawberries mean love and uh, and uh birds in my tree and uh and rainy day mushroom pillow all these songs were were thrown onto the first album i believe wasn't that true george yeah paxton's yeah. factory car world's yeah. on fire and 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 then we did we were still uh falling short of having enough songs for the album so i came up with an instrumental or two at the end like past time with the sack and there was one other short instrumental you know i think and um that's how we got that album off the ground because we had a very short time and a low budget to get that uh, i think uni gave us five thousand dollars to do that that record which back in those days i guess was you know that was a good chunk of change <laughs> yeah <laughs> nowadays it gets you one song <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah so anyway uh yeah so uh, strawberry alarm clock actually was uh George, was that the uh, the name of your band? Was uh, Waterford Train? Was it back? Waterford there? Train, yeah. Right, and uh, so they brought to the table uh, their writing skills, and uh, Ed King and Lee Freeman and myself uh, brought our skills to the writing table, and uh, we just started, uh, you know, writing songs. And on to the second album, I think, which was what our sonically and musical kind of uh coming into our own that number two album um wake up it's tomorrow was was probably uh i feel one of our best albums that we did you know, know what lee, lee, lee freeman and ed king really came alive with pretty songs yeah, they did. strike out and and uh, a, a lot of good stuff happened on the second album uh, as a opposed to the third album when uni brought in the uh what they felt that we should be doing some outside writers but make it more commercial we started to lose a lot of our original quote unquote psychedelic fan base because they commercialized us a little bit with uh, horn arrangements and violins and we all of a sudden weren't you know in charge of our own uh artistic uh you know uh creativity and uh we kind of went off on a tangent and, and then then the after the third album which didn't do that great uh, we had a, a member change uh randy and george left we got a new uh lead guitar player and uh, gene came back uh jimmy Pittman uh started writing with me and we we started uh, going in a different direction and we lost more of our fan base we recorded a song from the hair from the play here called good morning starshine that didn't really chart um uh we the, oliver came out with uh the the similar song uh actually uh the arrangement was uh, uh classic and it, it it kicked our butt uh putting out uh simultaneously we didn't know he was going to put out i don't think uni uh knew they were going to that Oliver was going to uh release good morning starshine that climbed the charts and our good morning starshine kind of took the back seat and the fourth album pretty much went by the wayside and had very poor sales and i think at that point uh, i quit the band and uh strawberry alarm pluck went on for a while with with gene and uh, gene gunnels and uh, lee freeman and ed king and uh, paul marshall came in at that point and was playing with the band and those guys went on i think for a couple more years until they disbanded and ed moved on to leonard skinner 
you know what else happened was Steve Bartek, on, when we were doing the first album, he was also asked to join the band. Ah. But he went home and told his mom, they, they want me to join the band. As, but Steve was only 15 years old. He huh. really was the youngest. And his mom said, his mom, they lived next door to me. And his mom said, absolutely not. You're, you're finishing school. You're not doing anything of the sort. And so he had to, to stay home. <laughs> yeah, he had to stay home and and watch us like Gene did, watch the band go on to success. And and what else happened then was that Steve was my songwriting partner. And so we were all of a sudden separated, you know. I was cut off from because there there were no cell phones or computers. Yeah. And so that was the end of that. I didn't get to Right, he and I had a thing writing together, and it was much different than Randy and I writing together. But because I wrote with Randy too, but it, but it, with Randy, I was just writing music, and and with, and he was writing lyrics. With Steve, I was Steve and I were both writing music and lyrics back and forth. We were trading it off, and so we had a real thing, you know, a real fun songwriting partnership. And, well, it's uh, interesting you say that, George, because that was the same relationship I had with Ed King. Yeah. Like uh, Incense and Peppermints being our first hit. And then Uni said, hey, we need another Incense and Peppermints to follow that up. So uh, on the end of the song, on the Shala La part, at the very ending of Incense and Peppermints, there were these major seventh chords. And Russ Regan, the, our, our, our guy that signed us uh, A&R, uh, man uh, at Uni Records said, "Hey, Mark, we need another incense of peppermints. You and Ed need to come up with one." And so I, I took the major seventh chords that we used on the end of the Shallow Laws, and I came up with this this uh, beginning of the song for tomorrow. And tomorrow, I think, made it up to number twenty one on the top one hundred, somewhere in yeah, there. Twenty three. Yeah, twenty three. Um, didn't quite get the the push from uni because they had a problem in their distribution department the records weren't getting to the record stores we would show it up in the omaha nebraska to sign records and there wasn't any records in the record stores uh, something happened and so that that song could have gone higher and we re even re-recorded it in stereo for our second album and that was that that was a way better version than our original 45 that we did in mono and um so anyway, that was the second song Ed and I uh, wrote the music to, and I wrote the lyrics to that song, by the way, tomorrow. Uh, then the, the third song that charted was... Um, Barefoot. Uh, Barefoot. Was well, what about Sit With The Guru? Oh, no, Sit With The Guru, yeah. Yeah, Sit With The Guru. I came up uh, with the uh, music on that, and Ed King uh, helped me on that one, too, I think. And it had a la-la uh, ending on it. Yeah. I can't say it. Right, and then on the, the, the fourth song that charted was uh, Barefoot in Baltimore. Uh, only went, I think, was a 62, 63, but it was number one in Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. Hey, Mark, so, do, Mark, do you remember? That statue of you, Mark. Huh? That's where I saw that statue of you was in Baltimore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> That's where it was. Hey, I Mark, hope I wasn't nude. Mark, do you remember? Yeah. We went, Bill Holmes took us to this uh, lady and guy, I, I don't know, they were older people, and they were songwriters, I think, and, and they lived in Sherman Oaks or somewhere, and we went to their house, and they had somebody come over to play songs that were, like this guy was able to mimic songs, and so he had written something that was just like Incense and Peppermints, and they were trying to get us to record it, but we didn't. And it was, we were in their house, I, I don't that's that was obscure. Weird. Yeah, That's it is really obscure. obscure. It's not ringing a bell. Yeah, I wish I could remember who they were. It's probably somebody that's famous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, all I need is a name, and I'm sure that I would come back up with it. But, but yeah, there was a lot of uh, weird serendipity things that happened to us in the band, and uh, we were very lucky to be on a dozen or more TV shows uh, nationwide. And uh, I won't name drop, but. Uh, we never made it to Ed Sullivan, but yeah. we had a lot of other great shows. And uh, our, our best time was with the Beach Boys uh, on, on two tours. Uh, George has 
George has the exact dates that we left and came back. I, I'm not I'm not that good with all that. But it was the best time of our life. Even Ed King mentioned that uh, the best time, even in in his whole career, was uh, traveling with the Beach Boys, the Buffalo Springfield, ourselves on a southern tour, and we actually went out a total of about eight weeks with those guys. Wow. So what 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 prompted you guys to get back together? to get the band back together or were you ever well george I, I i have to hand it over to george because he's been carrying he's been carrying kind of like the gauntlet all along uh in in 82 i remember i i rejoined uh with lee freeman and uh, uh lee gaffney and uh, a couple other guys uh we we wrote and gene gene played and, with us yeah i think gene i think you were playing drums there man right yeah in 82 at the it music was over at, it was over at lee's house on i think california street or something we played at the music machine in santa monica and right we, we packed the place played drums. We yeah jammed. sold out yeah we played two gigs and broke up oh, there's a okay so do you remember how that came about so lee and i lee came over to my house he had just finished touring with donna summers it, lee was state lee was also with leonard skinner in a different capacity than he was like a stage guy and his wife made their clothes and right and, then, and steve i mean steve uh lee played harmonica also sometimes yeah, but really good harmonica oh he's amazing but um lee came and then he after skinner the plane crash so then he got the gig doing the same thing with donna summer and uh and her husband bruce i forget his name Udano. yeah 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 and uh anyway so lee had just finished touring with them and he called me up and he goes what are you doing and i said wow i'm just sitting here going through some songs looking at old songs he goes i want to come over and go through old songs with you and and go through your songs with you and so i said okay so he came over and we were looking at stuff and then um somebody told us get out the the calendar section it was on a sunday and they said get the calendar section out and look at the advertisement for um the music machine in santa monica it says strawberry alarm clock and coming soon and so lee and i looked at it and and sure enough it said strawberry alarm clock and it so we called the place and we said um we see that strawberry alarm clock you have you're advertising it and the guy goes, yes. Um, and we said, well, we're the strawberry alarm clock. And who are you? Who, who, who's coming? You know, and he said, oh, this is perfect. This is what I was trying to do. He goes, I was fishing around trying to find you guys. And I figured if I advertised you that you would call. And so and he goes, this is perfect. He I goes, remember that. Yeah. He goes, we want you guys to we guys. We want you guys to play at our at the music machine. And uh, he, he said, I think it would be great. So then Lee and I and, and Lee Gaffney and Mark and Gene, and who else was there? I forget. It seems like somebody else was there. But I guess um, that probably was it. But we put together some of the songs. But mainly we were doing Lee Gaffney and Lee Freeman songs. That yeah. they, were kind of new. they had 25 new songs. And Anyway, we played some of our old songs too, I believe. But yeah, we did. I remember that night. It was at maximum capacity at at the yeah. music machine. And you had and, a hammer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I came on as a side man. I wasn't uh, trying to spearhead any projects in in that uh, reincarnation and um, of the band. And uh, the two Lees wrote a bunch of songs, and uh, and I. I just said, I'll be a keyboard player. You guys write the songs. And they went to their producer and played them all the new songs. And I heard that the producer didn't like any of the songs. When I heard that, I said, I'm done. I quit. Oh, no. Mark, he, he recorded them. That was Rick Gerard, the producer. And yeah, he but recorded. George is gone. Okay, guys. <laughs> uh, there, was no, there was no hip material there. No. When I heard that, I bailed. Yeah, there was, was nothing I, was I, like a hit. Yeah, I worked I worked for uh like two solid months rehearsing with them and I just said, you know, 
I, I was not involved as one of the songwriters. And when I did that, that was a big mistake uh, because the Strawberry Alarm Clock has a lot to do with the roots coming from these six bands that I had joined. And then, and then uh, my background not being injected into the, 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 the writing, uh, I think was very detrimental to that, that branch of the alarm clock that attempted it. Uh, it went off in a weird direction again. And um, so, uh, and then George, uh, you want to take it from here because in 2006, you caught, uh, or in the 90s, George had the strawberry alarm clock with, uh, uh, with Lee Freeman and, and, and a bunch of new members. Uh, well, no, first what we did was in 83, right after you decided you didn't want to do it, then we had to find a keyboard player. Oh, and I know who it was. It, that was, it was Steve Lindsay. He was Mort Lindsay's son. Was the oh, first. Yeah, I that was the was first. The other, I thought it was another guy that um, Gene might know. A uh, super good keyboard player. Oh well, that's yeah, that's Peter Wozner. Uh, no, there was somebody else. Uh, mm, I I remember when the Prophet synthesizer. Oh, came out. let's see. It was. Uh, was it uh, was Mike from Hungary? Do you remember Gene who, who no. came in? No. Was a keyboard player from Hunger? I don't think so. No. Anyway, so George, go ahead and finish up because we're... Well, uh, in, in, in 83, we, what we did is we got a gig at Harrah's in Lake Tahoe. Right. Mark didn't want to do it. And so... I think I had quit as well. And time. you had quit as well. So we went and got Randy Seal back. So we had so there was me and and Randy Seal and Lee Freeman. So we had three original guys, and so uh, and and Lee was they were they were the two singers in the band basically, and so um, it was pretty good. You know, and then we got James Hare to play guitar, and we got Pete Wasner to play keyboards, and um, Wasner was from Little Feet. And, uh, it, and it, that was a fun, that was a fun gig. And then we came back and we had to, we, we fired Randy and so, and then we, and Dennis Dragon took over, but then he didn't want to play drums live. He only wanted to program drums. And so we did a bunch of recordings and, and then, uh, then I forget what happened. Oh, then Bruce Hubbard came in, 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 uh, the next, like in eight drums. Four. Yeah. Bruce Hubbard became the drummer. And he stayed with us and, until 2001. As a matter of fact, there was a show down in San Diego that we played, and it had Randy Seal, Bruce Hubbard, and Gene, all three of them there. Gene, if you remember, you, you were playing like cowbell and stuff, and your wife was taking pictures of the band. Yeah. Your then wife. <laughs> More cowbells. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I came out and, and played on uh, Incense. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had two drummers, two full sets at that point with Bruce. Yeah, with, we had Randy and Bruce, yeah. Hey, George, you want to fast forward? Okay. Because we have a oh, lot yeah. of stuff. That so, oh, so 2006, yeah. So so then in 2006, Randy Seal and I um, went over. Randy said, I, I have this idea about a song. He goes, my dad, when my dad, before my dad died, he had this vision of a white light and da, 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 the typical white light thing. And, and he says, but and he, but he had a kind of an interesting story behind it. And he goes, and I want to try to write some music and, and lyrics with it. And he said, I want you and Steve to help me. And so we went and Steve goes, I told Steve and Steve goes, oh, good. He goes, I want to try to record something in my new studio. He just got all the new Pro Tools and everything. And so we went in and we recorded th this song called White Light. And um, and then we called Mark and Mark still didn't want to be in the band. Well, <laughs> we were begging him. And then I said, well, we got a gig and, and it's which the gig never came about, but it was supposed to be the it was called the Psychedelic Summit. And it was um, in Philadelphia with with Iron Butterfly and Vanilla Fudge and us. Wow. And uh, what ended up happening was the we had an agent that who, he was good, and then he lost his mind. <laughs> he he found freebasing, and that was the end of that. Everything went right out the window. 
And um, so that we packed it in. But at just before he went out the window, we had called Mark and said, we've got this gig and it's it's in September and, and it's, and this or no, it was coming up in February of like 2007, I think. And then, and uh, and Mark said, he goes, Bartex in, and I said, yeah. And he goes, and Randy, and I said, yeah. And he goes, count me in. So I said, okay. And he goes, I want to do it. So I thought, well, Mark's back. Well, basically, uh, I think the catalyst there was when George said, hey, Steve Bartek wants to be in the Strawberry Alarm Clock, and I said, count me in. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Because I knew that we would have, uh, I mean, somebody, Steve is, uh, he has discipline and he his ideas are, are so aligned with the band that I knew that there was a chance that we can make this happen after waiting all these years, you know, of false starts and everything. So I thought, wow, you know, I maybe this will work. So... Uh, <laughs> I mean, Gene came back. I mean, it was Gene and Randy and me and George and Steve Bartek and uh, Howie Anderson on guitar, which was approved by Ed King before he passed away when we played with Ed uh, in Champaign, Illinois at a uh, 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 Roger Ebert's uh, Forgotten Film Festival he had every year. We played there and there was a reunion of the strawberry alarm clock in 2007 that was brought about by roger ebert where we all converged at the virginia theater in champaign illinois and uh uh you're asking me well how did that happen well roger ebert happened to write the screenplay to to the uh film beyond the valley of the dolls oddly enough and uh the strawberry alarm clock had three songs uh on that movie and he said as one and he was fighting cancer and he had really bad cancer of the jawbone and and everything and one of my one of my wishes was to get the strawberry alarm clock to come to champagne at my film festival on the last day when i show beyond the valley of the dolls if the band could get up on stage and all the members uh that have been in the band go up and 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 do a, a full set and uh, we all did that they paid our way they paid our hotels they paid our plane and and we set up on stage and we did a complete reunion uh which was really amazing and from that point forward it kind of kicked the band off it was kind of a kickoff jump off spot uh and from then on we started uh, rehearsing and uh starting to write songs again and playing a few gigs and i think that was the uh that lit the fuse and we're still together uh that was 2007 and here it is 2023 and we're we're still at it yeah the other thing is quite a bit of oh, touring, aren't you what's that i said you you're still doing quite a bit of touring not no we we do we do what we call a geriatric tour you know we play <laughs> twice a year <laughs> we, we play um, a lot we play of uh, whiskey yeah a lot of us has uh day jobs we're not so lucky to be retired like george but but uh uh, I, I think the band, our, our main, our main goal is, uh, trying to keep the band together, uh, as long as we can, uh, everybody's trying to stay healthy and, uh, we're writing songs and, uh, right now we're working on a brand new, uh, album, uh, that we hope we can get off the ground this year. <laughs> we were yeah, in the I studio thought, yesterday all day. Yeah. But the thing is, you know, we're running out of money real fast. Uh, albums nowadays, uh, studio time's super expensive. And uh, George got this idea of doing a GoFundMe. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, right now, we are uh, asking our fans to sign on to the Strawberry Alarm Clock GoFundMe and uh try to donate anything they have to help us get finish up this uh this new album uh, we're about uh, three quarters of the way through on it and we're out of funds so uh, it's uh, albums these days uh you know to make a good album it, it's it, it's not cheap uh, i don't care what anybody says about having a studio in your home and all that kind of thing yeah. Yeah. Uh, to get the songs uh, up to the sonic quality that we want and and we owe our fans 
um, we've got some really good songs that we're very proud of. And we have uh, put a bunch of blood, sweat, and tears into these uh, into these songs. And uh, we are trying to uh, find the essence of the, the 2023 alarm clock and, and give our fans something to, uh, to remember us by. And hopefully we can get um, uh, enough donations uh, on our GoFundMe to finish this album up. We're doing really well and a lot of our fans have, have given generously, but we're still a little off the mark on our goal. So can I interject uh, yeah. something? Yeah. Is that um, we, we, we did the Whiskey A Go-Go uh, in, I think it was December, and George decided, he says, hey, everybody, why don't we stay a couple of extra days in town and do some songs, maybe four of them, and, and see how things go. And we had a little bit of money in the bank, and so we decided to um, ask around to some friends of ours that had a studio, another friend of ours, Mike Stern, who was a uh, engineer and producer. And so we uh, said, why not? So we asked, asked, got all this uh, information regarding, uh, is this a possibility for us to do this within a couple of days? And so we, we did go in the studio and we recorded uh, basic tracks to, I think it was four songs. Yeah. Four songs, yeah. yeah. And our uh, what we had in the bank went away very fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We, went we from, had no clue. We, we had no clue we were going to be spending this amount of money. Yeah. But we had the momentum going, but we said, well, if we stop here, it's just going to be like every every time that we've gone in the studio, we've come to a dead end because of money. And so, again, George and Mark decided to do a, a GoFundMe ac uh, account. And Actually, it was George's idea. Okay. Yeah, I just I just took it upon myself to do it one day. Yeah. So so if we wanted to donate, where can we go? Where can we find your your GoFundMe? On our website, it's it's there. Um, so if we says, go here, if we go to the Strawberry Alarm Clock website, yeah, www.strawberryalarmclock.com. Right, and there's a link there that we can go to to yeah. do, uh, to the GoFundMe. Okay, but it's right on the front page of the website. Perfect. And I mean, even just a couple bucks from everybody helps out, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've had we've, you know we've five dollar ones, but we get up to five hundred. You know, it's like we we've had tremendous uh, support from our fan base and and even people that are just friends with us. They want to see uh, they want to see the this album uh, get to its completion because uh, it's it's uh, worthwhile for us uh, if we weren't so enthusiastic about it. We, we are, are really fired up about it. And uh, we get this album going, that means that we'll probably be out there, you know, back on, uh, on weekend tours and things like that again. Okay, well, if you get this album done, I've been waiting for, what, 50-something years for you guys to get to Vegas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I will do. You I will do everything I can. I'll use uh, all of the uh, uh, influence that we have here at the studio. We'll put this out on uh, right. a lot of the shows that we have um, because I've got shows. Uh, our, our station. Uh, we have our website. We have a, a, a YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and we also have a Roku channel. So we get out there to quite a few people, and I will start pumping this out there. So. Wow. That's we can get this done here real quick. So, I, I mean, it's, it's um, music has always been a passion for me. I've loved music for as long as I can remember. You know, when we were growing up, there was always music in the house. And we are, we were fortunate enough to have lived in a period where, in my humble opinion, the best music that we have ever created came out of the 60s and 70s, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And and I, I mean, it's just, you guys are, are an iconic part of that. And it's just, it's just awesome to see that, that you still have that passion and that you still want to create something that the fans want to see or hear. 
Um, it, it's, you know, I, I, it, it just, there's nothing like music. Music speaks to me like it, it, it's, you know, I feel it, I hear it, I see it, I taste it. And it's hard for some people to understand that. Um, I have a friend that's a drummer as well. Um, his name's Alan Childs. He was a drummer for uh, uh, David Bowie, Rod Stewart, uh, Julian Lennon. He's out on tour with John Waite now. Um, he has a show here called Psychedelic Circus. And cool. it, it's, I, I've just been, there is a generation that if we don't keep this alive, they're going to forget about it. It, it right. I mean, some of the crap that's coming out now, and, and it's almost impossible for any creativity in the music industry. It's like there is a formula that you have to fit and you do this, 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 and this, and put it out there. And, and there, the original music just isn't there anymore. You know, there's a few out there, don't get me wrong. But uh, okay, so I'll, my rant's done. <laughs> you know, well, we we don't have a manager, we don't have a record company, we don't have an agency, and we don't have a producer. So basically, we're completely a good thing. All we're, of self, we're self we're self contained. Yeah, and we have... and we still have the same creativity factor that we had back in the '60s, and we haven't. We haven't been influenced. It's like a, my expression is we're like horses with blinders on. We have allowed the external forces of other styles of music to seep into our original 60s feel. So when we play, we don't sound like any other band. No. Our vocals are different. Our our uh, The guitar playing's a little different. The... Uh, uh, even the drum beats are different, and my and my keyboard playing is unique to the band because I have kind of formulated a way of playing that only, you know, I can't explain how I play, but but it's unique to the band. It just fits. So uh, I I couldn't play with any other band because I don't do cover songs. I'm yeah. not a cover song guy. I mean, I suppose I could learn them, but I never, you know, I like listening to the original keyboard players on like you know. Wider shade of pale. How do you how do you beat that? You yeah. know. Uh, so you know, there's some great music out there. We just want to be, we just want to be acknowledged for what we've done to contribute to the uh, history of rock and roll. And um, once we we get that from our fans, and this is one way that they can give back by going on uh, GoFundMe and uh, donate anything that you have, ten bucks, twenty bucks, whatever, and um, I, I'm sure you'll be uh, very satisfied with the results that this album is going to put out there. Okay, I want to ask one favor, um, and and there is a video that you guys did uh, of the creation of your second album. You remember that? No, no. <laughs> you mean of second album? Uh, the the fifty the the fiftieth anniversary. Oh, the fiftieth anniversary. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, All right. you mean the 50th anniversary, not our second. album cover. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, do I have your permission to run that on our Roku channel? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that was. Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. We should also mention uh, Robert Jacob with our light show. Yes, I did. You did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, we want to. We want to put a uh, big shout out to Roger. Uh, Roger. Roger Ebert. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> Roger Ebert. Uh, Robert Jacobs uh, has, wake him up. has done an incredible job at our shows, uh, doing digital and analog uh, light shows, along with uh, uh, Richard uh, from uh, the original Wizard Richard Black Young. Show. Yeah, Richard Young, and. Uh, uh, when we were playing, like uh, Gene mentioned, the Whiskey A Go Go in, in on Sunset Strip in Hollywood uh, and other venues, and so when we do our shows, it, it's sometimes it's I, I tell people even if you don't like our music, it's worth coming just to see the light show, ah. you know. <laughs> but uh, when you put the two of them together, it's really a combination. And Robert has been a hundred percent behind the band and really helped us in uh, keeping everything moving forward, uh, keeping the psychedelic mood going. 
And uh, whether they call us acid rock, psychedelic rock, I mean, we didn't come up with any of these terms. The, the band was uh, pretty straight uh, when we played on stage. Uh, we were in a bunch of druggies on stage, staggering yeah. on and, and that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, we were probably one of the more tamer bands to play in Hollywood that wasn't, you know, ripped from whatever uh, their choice of uh, alcohol or drugs or whatever. Uh, we, we performed pretty straight on stage. Our songs <laughs> were far too complicated to try to have our mental facul faculties not running 100 percent. So uh, anyway, uh, it, I, it was great being on your show. I, I, I really appreciate you asking us on here. It's just, it's, uh, anytime, anytime you yeah. got anything you're, you're one to promote, just uh, give me a holler. We're, we're happy to, to help put it out there. Um, you know, that's what we do. That's why the station's here. Uh, you know, I created this for uh, people who don't have the money to to go to the big guys. And, uh, you know, it's, it's we're family here. Uh, I started this about eight years ago now. And uh, some of the people that started with me are still here. And right. it's it, it's a passion for me. It's it keeps me out of the uh, strip clubs and the casinos and the bars and uh, the ones I go. But, uh, yeah, seriously. Uh, and uh, I, I do have to give one quick shout out, and I hope it doesn't piss anybody off. But um, if, if you know anything about food trucks, huh. and there is also piss us off. If you know anything, <laughs> if you know anything about Hollywood, uh, now I went to Hollywood High School. I lived there. There was a place called Pink's, and it's still there. Oh, yeah. One know. of the best chili dogs in the world from Pink's until I came across Hot Diggity Dogs. Yeah. Uh, here, yeah. here in Las Vegas, we have a food truck called Hot Diggity Dogs, and their chili dogs will meet or exceed Pink's. And Wow. That's hard to do. It, it, it is, but I, I'm living proof. And the owner of that food truck is right there. Hey! <laughs> we call it Genie's Weenies. Genie's <laughs> Weenies. <laughs> well, I, I, so I told Gene uh, when we were talking, uh, giving him directions on how to get here, just about a block from here is a, uh, a dog uh, daycare center. And it's called Hot Diggity Dog. Oh, <laughs> And so I thought, I'm going to go over there and talk to him about getting Gene to bring the truck over. <laughs> yeah. And, and, think I do dog. <laughs> and, and we'll tell the people, well, if you board your dogs here, we're going to turn them into hot dogs and sell them to people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't do that. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> um, and, but, and the uh, food trucks. I'll, are, I'll put a plug in. If, you, if you're in Vegas uh, every first Friday of the month, yeah, I'm at First Friday Festival. Yeah. And, and and if you if you've been to Vegas, if you've ever been to Vegas, first Fridays are a gas. I mean, you you have to be here and, and go down uh, uh, Container Park, uh, down on uh, Fremont Street. Just uh, and where where exactly do you set up? Uh, it's uh, it's near Charleston and uh, and Arts. Oh, the Arts District. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Where all of the streets come together. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> Charleston and yeah, all that. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, sorry. Back. We're done plugging me, okay? Okay. <laughs> you know what? Let's plug Mark. He's at his shop. So Mark, so Genie's Weenies, and we have Mark's Fishy Pets. Yes. <laughs> so Mark, Mark's a Tropical Fish in North Hollywood, in, in NoHo, the upscale, the new, you know, yeah, there it is. Yeah, turn around, Mark. It's on the back of your shirt. <laughs> the whole thing. There it is. Mark's Tropical Fish, yeah. NoHo Arts District. I love it. It's a bit that area has been all refurbished. You can't even. It's unbelievable. It's so cool. NoHo. Yeah. yeah. The Arts District down there. Anyway, so, uh, yes. So whatever you do, don't quit your day job. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't eat tropical fish, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> They're not good. Well, we, have fish, we have fish and hot dogs. Nice <laughs> yeah. combination. George, if you wanted to put in some kind of a plug on how people might, uh, how someone might, we're, we're going to do that in a minute. How what? What with management? Oh, and, management. I'm management sorry. Never mind. And, and uh, yes, agency, please. please. What if you if 
Sure, if somebody's got a legitimate, you know, agency or, you know, record company that wants a really, really good band, <laughs> let us know. Go to our website, strawberryalarmclock.com. As a matter of fact, these T-shirts here, yeah. while we're plugging, <laughs> Gene's got one, too, in a multicolored yeah. one. Yeah, and uh, if you and if if anybody wants to see the history of the band, uh, that that website is uh, really uh, in depth. It's a comprehensive website uh, that you could read about each member of the band and some of their background. And Gene's holding up one of our other shirts that are available. Yeah, that that's is a multicolored on one. Website. Uh, we also have coffee mugs and fun stuff like that. But well, yeah. um, uh, seriously, <laughs> seriously speaking, though, uh, good idea. <laughs> I think that we're going to try to keep this band together as long as we can. Uh, we're all getting up in the years, and uh, we we want to keep the, the same vibe going as long as we can. So, uh, catapulting us into the next level. Um, I, I can't stress enough how we really want to finish this album up. I know I've been harping on it the whole interview, but if anybody... Uh, Dude, that's why you're here. Yeah. That's why you're here. If anybody... I mean, I'm, get, I'm getting to the point now where I think we might even be putting a teaser out of one of the new songs soon, so everybody get an idea of what, what our music is going to sound like. Maybe give them a little, uh, you know like a, a, a short trailer one of these days. But in the meantime, I'll put it here on the station. All right. That, that'll be great. Uh, we have, we we're, we're, we're getting to the point now where we have about a half a dozen songs in the can. Uh, probably final mixes are, uh, if not done, we're pretty close. And we have a couple more songs to finish up. And uh, uh, hopefully we can get that that done because uh, we'd really like to get it out this year. We don't want it to go into next year at all. Uh, we've we've been there, uh, done that. Uh, this year we we have a, a definite a definite uh, deadline. We have to finish this. Okay, we will do everything we can here to make that happen. We have got to keep moving forward with it. Right arm. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's been a blast being on the show. Oh, yeah, thank you, John. Like I said, you guys are welcome anytime. Uh, I, I I love doing it, and, and I know the people watching do. Um, we we average about uh, twenty six to thirty six thousand uh, views a month. Nice. So, um, we we're doing okay. Uh, we got a couple million uh, uh, viewers on our YouTube channel, and I think we're up to about wow. six thousand subscribers on. Uh, nice. So yeah, you know, and 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 it's just um, it, it it's like you. This is my passion. I love doing it. It's not a job. Um, I don't I I don't make much money at it. I mean, <laughs> you know, but it's uh, it it's it passion. keeps me out of trouble. It's a good passion. Yeah. yeah. It, and, and sometimes it, uh, the money isn't important. It's just your passion, and also the music is a universal language, and it brings people together and. That's why John Styles on WWD BTV. Yeah, baby. Uh, if, if you have Roku, I'll give myself a plug here now. Uh, if you have Roku, go to our Roku uh, channel, uh, WWD BTV. And uh, one of the shows on there is called Double Exposure. And what I've done is I have taken, and I'm sure you've seen this all over YouTube. I've taken dancers who may be dancing to, you know, some 40s music and i will change the soundtrack to the blue man group or something like nice. that that's my therapy so yeah. i think I've got about 40 of those up there i've got some fred astaire and and you know just some that that's that's my passion that's my therapy and yeah climbing up on the clock tower and you know <laughs> <laughs> all right gentlemen we're gonna our, our time is kind of up uh so we're going to wrap it up this week, and I would like to thank everyone that watches the show and supports the station uh, here at WWDB TV. Uh, we appreciate it. That's why we're here. We're here for you. And please, uh, even if it's just a couple bucks, go to the website, donate a few bucks. Let's get this album done because uh, I'm dying to hear it. 
And uh, remember, if you're going to do it, do it with styles. There you go. Nice work, John.